Welcome uh, everyone to the IBC lunch. Um, and I just wanted to mention before we start uh, to discuss science that we will have a group photo uh, taken after the lunch. Everyone is welcome, including the visitors. We'll be proud to claim you. <laughs> um, and uh, speaking about visitors, we just had uh, an excellent uh, ITC colloquium by Phil Hopkins, whom we know. Uh, he was in our corridor as a graduate student and matured to uh, an independent and leading scientist, uh, currently a professor at Caltech. We also have uh, uh, Raul Jimenez and Licia Berdel visiting us uh, at the Radcliffe Institute, but also spending time with us in the coming year or semester? Year. Year. So um, they will be around and hopefully give some presentations to hear about their latest work. Uh, so today we have uh, actually four presentations, all of which are um, from uh, our visitors. So we cannot set the standard of um, standing uh, within the time limit, but usually our members do not stand within the time limits. It's only the visitors, so I think. Uh, so the first talk will be given by Phil Hopkins, um, and he will talk about dust is not gas, surprising implications for star formation and stellar abundances. And then we continue with another visitor, um, uh, Jennifer Van Seder, uh from uh, Ohio State. Okay. Oh yeah, so where is Lorenzo? Uh, so uh, Jennifer is visiting us and she will talk about how to measure stellar balances with the um, astro uh, seismology. And uh, after that we'll hear from Kevin Schall uh, from the Heidelberg Institute of Theoretical uh, Studies over there. And he will tell us about how dynamic shocks in cosmological simulations. And finally, we'll, we'll hear from uh, Rodolfo Montes. Uh, he's from Vandenberg University. Where is Rodolfo? Oh, over here. Uh, and he will tell us out, about out of on a limb, uh, UV and X-ray emission from AGB stuff. Phil. All right. Uh, I'm supposed to have the mic on, right? Yes. yes. OK. So uh, I'm just going to talk about one very specific aspect of my ridiculously general title. Uh, these movies are just to show some pretty pictures, but the point is there's a lot of interesting things about dust to, to study, despite some people wanting to fall asleep as soon as the word is mentioned. And if anything, we here at Harvard and those of us as well at Caltech should be aware of in the wake of the last year's BICEP events, it's never take the dust for granted, all right? Don't assume you understand it because there's actually a lot of puzzles that we don't understand. So these are just a few examples of things that we don't understand about dust and even the nearby interstellar medium, that there don't appear to be enough metals to explain the dust we need. There are way too many big dust grains, sort of super micron size in the solar neighborhood. The dust appears to form too early compared to models when you look at high redshift quasars and GRBs, and it does all sorts of crazy stuff or I cite all the planet formation literature where people have come up with incredibly clever ideas about dust dynamics doing interesting things. So the point I want to focus on is something that has been well studied in both the terrestrial turbulence literature and the planet formation literature, namely that dust uh, does not move like gas. Dust has unique dynamics. Dust grains, especially the massive dust grains that contain most of the mass of metals in dust and thus an order unity fraction of the metals in the ISM, move like aerodynamic particles, which means they aren't perfectly coupled to the gas. And in a turbulent medium, this means that you can segregate dust and gas. So that's what all these movies are showing. The colors show the gas and the particles show the dust. And these are from wildly different scales, different assumptions about the types of turbulence. But this is well known. And in fact, in the terrestrial literature, this has actually been measured and well understood in the lab. There's actual experimental data, not just theoretical simulations. So the Scaling turns out to be interesting enough that if you ask, okay, there are these big particles, dust bunnies in our atmosphere that do cool things. In a protoplanetary disk, there's centimeter-sized pebbles that do all sorts of cool dynamics. What if I scale this up to a molecular cloud? I've got a big neutral pile of gas that's turbulently moving. I've got micron or submicron sized grains. It turns out those cases are very analogous to a centimeter-sized pebble in a protoplanetary disk in terms of the aerodynamics of the particles, and the fact that the dominant force on the dust is in fact aerodynamic drag, as opposed to Coulomb uh, forces, Lorentz forces, etc. So in a paper with an undergraduate, Hyung-Suk Lee, uh, which should be out on the archive relatively soon, we've been 
putting this all into a GMC size simulation and stirring. So dust, obeying the aerodynamic equations and Lorentz forces with supersonic MHD turbulence of the sort we think would be in GMCs with gravity and disc rotation, etc. And this is what you get. And I just want to show how remarkably different, if you zoom in in detail, the dust and the gas can be. So the dust can form these razor-thin filamentary structures that are much thinner than the gas filaments that we're familiar with from looking at molecular clouds, because the dust doesn't feel pressure directly. It just feels the drag force from the, the gas. And it can form structures sometimes where there isn't a gas structure, because of, for example, vorticity and strain in the gas trapping the dust grains effectively. So you can see there's not in detail that great a correlation between the dust and gas densities. So quantitatively, this is a plot showing some of these results. This is the probability of a dust enhancement. So this is the metallicity in dust in a given patch relative to the average for different types of simulations in different types of GMCs. And the point is the scatter in this can be very large. This is just taking little patches and saying, what's the dust to gas ratio basically in each patch? And it can vary by orders of magnitude. So what are the physics? Since this is a very quick talk, I'm just going to give you the one sentence, but there's lots of literature on this. The idea is, as I said, dust moves as an aerodynamic particle. It obeys the equation on top, where there's this drag time scale or stopping time scale in the protoplanetary literature that depends on rho solid is the internal density of the dust grain, A grain is its size, rho gas is the gas density, and delta V is the dust gas relative velocity, which we usually, in the terrestrial and protoplanetary literature, it's always the case that the turbulence is highly subsonic. A qualitative important change in the GMC case is the turbulence is supersonic. And in that supersonic limit, basically what you can derive is that there's a free streaming length of the dust that scales in this very simple way with the dust size and the density. And this is not a negligible number compared to sizes of star formation in GMCs. And that's really where some interesting effects can happen. In the protoplanetary literature, these are some examples where this is well studied. But the idea is, as I make the grains larger, their dynamics change. So basically, these plots show on very small scales and very large scales in clouds some different dynamics. So when the dust grains are infinitesimally small in this plot here, they're perfectly coupled to the gas. So in this plot at the left, the gas density isn't changing. The gas is just circulating. And so the dust just tracks the gas. And in the plot up top, I've got small dust grains that are moving with the gas. They're well coupled to the gas. They move with the gas. But I've got some critical intermediate scale where this streaming length is comparable to the size of turbulent structures in the medium. And then I can do cool things. In this simple case, that those little arrows show the gas vorticity in this totally toy model experiment. I fling the dust grains out of these uh, vortical regions. In the GMC, I can pile up dust in some subclumps and not in others. Uh, and then if the dust is too big, it just free streams through everything. It's just a cannonball and doesn't feel any drag. So it just smears itself uniformly all over the cloud. So quantitatively, there's actually some suggestion that this has been seen in some nearby clouds. There's been many different interpretations of these observations, but you can ask nearby clouds where there's a, at least some observational hint of fluctuations in the dust to gas ratio. What's the characteristic size scale of those fluctuations? And do they match this sort of free streaming length they'd expect from this simple aerodynamic argument. And for a few nearby clouds and one galactic nucleus where this is happening on large scales, there's a tentative hint that this is happening. And again, see these references for more details. This is quite a detailed uh, uh, discussion we could have just about this. So in local clouds, I could do something totally crazy, and there's the archive paper if you want to read about the totally crazy thing, and say, let's take the most extreme possible fluctuation my simulation predicts, and assume that that happens in a self-gravitating core or overlaps with a self-gravitating region. This is a factor of 100 enhancement in the dust to gas ratio. That means that the metallicity in that region is one. Not one times solar, it's one. It is a half metal region that is self-gravitating. So extrapolating to the extreme, you might form really funky objects, totally metal stars, order unity metallicity objects. And we don't actually know what these would look like, to be honest. This is something I've talked about with Charlie. We don't really have stellar evolution models that, that can appropriately handle these systems. So the problem, though, is that these are going to be very rare. So it's not like this would be common where you can easily rule it out. They'd be sort of one in 10,000 or a million in the large GMCs would uh, be the statistics of this. And the typical dispersion in stellar abundances from the fact that different regions have more or less dust, and when they collapse, the star drags that dust in and incorporates it into the star, would be like a fraction of a dex, well within the observational limits. That's the sort of one sigma typical limit. So that's not that interesting. But what about at high redshifts? 
So let's push on this idea. You've got a high redshift proto-galaxy. The disk is primarily neutral. So now the disk is even more like a protoplanetary disk, where the dust can stream around aerodynamically through the whole disk. It's modestly turbulent and has very low metallicities, critically. So this is a situation we've been simulating, and this is a paper in preparation. It turns out these conditions actually enhance the dust-to-gas fluctuations. These different curves assume different dust sizes, effectively. So for the most massive, largest dust grains, a tenth of a micron to a micron, you can get these very large fluctuations in the dust-to-gas ratio, up to a million times the mean. Well, that's pretty exciting, because there's a lot of people who've argued that there's a critical dust-to-gas ratio above which low temperature cooling becomes efficient, and a contracting cloud can fragment and form low-mass stars. And below that critical dust-to-gas ratio, you don't fragment and thus you don't form low-mass stars, and thus we have no hope of seeing the stellar relics today. You'd form pop 3 type stars that would be short-lived and we'll never see them in the local universe. So maybe these patches, where you have very high dust density, are special. Because these low-density patches with relatively little dust, let's say our galaxy average metallicity is well below this fragmentation threshold, then these regions will never form low-mass stars. But these regions that have extra dust piled up here and here, past this critical metallicity, and can form low-mass stars. So not only does this provide a way to form low-mass stars in these systems, but you might think, OK, if there's a huge overdensity of dust in those regions, will the stars look weird as a consequence? And I think the answer is yes. They'll look weird in a way that seems to match a lot of observational hints for at least some of the very metal-poor population. So this is a typical example of an extremely metal-poor star. This has a metallicity of about minus 4. For now, just look at the points. This is the abundance ratio distribution as a function of atomic number. I'm not showing the very high atomic numbers uh, here. But the point is, it's very well known that these stars often exhibit these very large enhancements in the light element abundances, CNO, but also often uh, uh, sodium, magnesium, silicon, etc. So the simplest hypothesis you might try to explain these with is take your favorite supernova yield model, average it over the IMF, over all the different masses of supernovae that can explode, and make it, of course, with metal poor progenitors. And that's what those red histograms are. That's the Woosley and Weaver models. Uh, and they do terribly at explaining this. I can add in more exotic components. And many people have worked very diligently on this in the supernova literature. And so the best fit from Nomoto 2006 involving a mix of supernovae and hypernovae and allowing the yields not to be IMF averaged, but to pick and choose the progenitor masses is the green histograms. But what if I just take the IMF averaged yields and do the dumbest possible thing and take my Weingartner and Drain table that I've got you know, saved on my laptop of what the dust properties are in the local universe. I'll take their best fit model to the dust grains from nearby cold clouds. And I'll pick a patch of my simulation that has 100 to 1 dust to gas enhancement and take Bruce's model for what the abundance of those large grains is, what the internal composition of them is, and add that to the IMF average yields. That gives me these black histograms, kind of shockingly on target. And in fact, you can get something very similar to the observed enhancement distribution in the carbonaceous grains by just taking the simulation, folding that totally naive model that certainly can't be right in detail because it's calibrated to low redshift, metal-rich environments. Uh, but yet it produces lots of carbon-enhanced stars similar to what we see at these high redshifts. And more strikingly, and this is the last thing I want to show, if you look at the magnesium and silicon, there's potentially a really clear tracer here. So in, if it's that you formed the star because you dumped a ton of dust into a region, magnesium and silicate have to be tightly coupled because they're coming from the same dust grains. Okay? They're in the same grains. They have a well-defined ratio. So up top, you can't quite see the shaded range. There's a shaded range showing the range of Mg over Si for ISM dust. There's a different prediction for what metal-poor supernovae produce, which is quite a bit lower. On the other hand, in supernova and burning models, magnesium and calcium are very tightly coupled. They come from the same stars, the same stages. And so they produce this band of very narrow scatter. And yet we see a lot of these carbon-enhanced stars are tremendously enhanced in magnesium relative to calcium. And these tracks are exactly the tracks you get from that dust enhancement model. There's one free parameter, which is why there's different tracks plotted, which is how much of the dust is in silicate dust versus how much is in carbonaceous dust. I don't know that, so I just draw a few different lines here. But it might explain why these weird populations don't look like supernovae, but do look disturbingly like ISM dust. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks.
yep. uh, subject to radiation pressure that would push it away from the mm -hmm. star. Yeah. So you might expect that dust abundance would actually scale at least as a mechanistic square rather than mm -hmm. solar or even you know yeah. less than that. So actually making the dust would be uh, Yes. Uh, yeah. I completely agree. So so the in the paper that I'm working on on this uh you know that sort of half the discussion section is basically the acknowledgement and sort of speculations about the fact that I think the the biggest assumption here uh, these other processes, I agree they exist, dust destruction, radiation pressure. You can actually show that on the time scales of these dynamics, those are subdominant, basically. So you're reasonably safe in ignoring those for this local dynamics. But yeah, the biggest assumption here is that in these super metal poor environments, you would have a significant fraction of the metals in dust. Um, now there's, I, and I agree, the, the simplest models wouldn't predict that. Um, at the same time, there seems to be more and more observations of high redshift systems that suggest that there's a, a normal dust to gas ratio at, it hasn't probed these low metallicities, but at metallicities of a hundredth of solar, for example. So, and that in turn has led to, of course, newer models where people have adjusted the, the grain growth models to, to fit. There's also some interesting suggestions that supernovae, so for example, 87A now has this tremendously large measured dust abundance in the ejecta. So if that can survive a reverse shock, which is not obvious that it should, uh, maybe then that's a way out of this. But yeah, I think that's the biggest roadblock. Well, so when I first started looking at this, I actually was very excited about exactly that, looking at the multiple populations in the massive globulars. Uh, unfortunately, I eventually convinced myself, or Charlie convinced me, that this couldn't work to explain those populations. Uh, first of all, the statistics don't quite work. It's not uh, common enough in those environments, probably. But more importantly, the abundances don't work. So. The problem is in the globular second, or whatever you want to call these other populations, you see things like you know, helium enrichment that I can't do that through dust. You know, so um, it just doesn't look like the abundance patterns actually match what you'd predict from this mechanism. Last question. Uh, there's another effect of dust that you haven't touched on here, which is that it's a very efficient extinctor of UV mm -hmm. radiation into the molecular cloud. Mm -hmm. which has a very direct and profound effect on the chemistry mm -hmm. of these clouds. Uh, so it seems to me that in principle, this idea is testable by looking at you know, the chemistry of these clouds. So if you begin to segregate these grains, mm -hmm. or even change their size substantially, yeah. their extincting power changes dramatically, mm -hmm. which can cause molecules to be photodestroyed deep in a cloud, yeah. whereas in current models they aren't. And so I would think that this would leave very clear chemical signatures if it's true. That's a very good thought. I hadn't actually thought of that. The, the studies, for example, that I showed and that I've thought about comparisons to were all basically just extinction mapping, so looking for variations in dust to gas uh, uh, that way. Um, um, but yeah, your point is, is that's a good one, and we should look at what the predictions are. Um, and you do need to revisit some of the models because there's the complication that the clustering of the dust is size dependent. So you can't just assume that there is dust or, or no dust or that all the dust moves together. But I, you can just take one of these simulations and in principle make that prediction. We should do that.
Everybody hear me? Mike? Okay. So I'm going to be talking today about something that's entirely different from the talk I'll be giving later this afternoon. So I won't be saying anything about stellar rotation, which is what I've been doing mostly these days. But I am going to talk about astroseismology. And when we think about astroseismology, if you've had any contact with the field, you usually think of it as a means to get you a mass for a star, a radius for a star, an age for a star. And usually when you do those things, you need composition as an input. You need a high resolution um, spectrum of the star in order to give you information about the abundances. But what we've been thinking about recently is because astroseismology opens a lot of windows for us about different observables that we didn't have access to in the past, we've been thinking about how you could go about using an astroseismic frequency spectrum itself in order to get you information on composition. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So when you're doing astroseismology, and you're looking at a star like the sun, this is the kind of power spectrum that you would see for a seismic target. It has this very characteristic shape. It has a Gaussian envelope of excess power that's due to P mode, pressure mode oscillations in the star. And this P mode spectrum has a very characteristic spacing to it, very regular, very comb-like spacing. And if the star inside were perfectly smooth and everything behaved nicely as it does when you're doing the algebraic, simple algebraic models for these things, these spacing would be perfect across every set of different modes here. These modes can be identified by their spherical harmonic degrees. So this spacing is called delta nu. It's called the large frequency separation. It's related to the square root of the mean density of the star. So just this number alone gets you uh, information about mass and radius. So delta nu should be constant across these guys, but it actually isn't because stars are not smooth in their interiors. They have features. So if you have features in a stellar interior that are sharp in comparison to the scale of the modes that are propagating there, those features inject a modulation into them. And in particular, this delta nu becomes modulated in a sinusoidal way. The amplitude of the modulation tells you how sharp that feature is in comparison to the scale of the mode. And the period of that oscillation tells you how deep that feature is in the star, the acoustic depth to the feature, the sound travel time from the surface to the feature. So what happens here is this is a means to measure sharp features in a star. Sharp features in the sound speed of a star are things like the helium ionization zone or the base of the convective envelope. And it's the base of the convective envelope that gives us a hook into composition. So this is just an example of what this thing would look like. This is, you look at the, the spacing in delta nu here, and it has a sinusoidal uh, shape to it. This period is the depth, and the amplitude tells you about the strength of it. So this comes back. The base of the convection zone has something to do with composition. And we talk about this commonly in the case of the sun. There is a problem with the oxygen abundance in the sun. People argue about oxygen to the 50% level in the solar case. And there are kind of two camps. There's the spectroscopists who tend to come up with lower oxygen abundances. And then there's the astroseismologists or the helioseismologists who are looking at features in the interior of the sun and saying we can't have this low oxygen abundance because it would change these features. And in particular, the oxygen abundance, oxygen contributes heavily to the opacity at the location of the base of the convective envelope in the sun. And if you increase the opacity of stellar models of, a, of the stellar material in this region, you deepen the convection zone. If you lower the opacity, you raise the convection zone up. So by having a low oxygen abundance, you predict convective envelopes that are too shallow. And astroseismology gives you a very precise measurement of where the base of the convection zone is. It's good to a part in 10 to the 4. So this is an example of several of these different models made with different compositions. This is the oldest composition. These are some of the newer versions. And this is the difference in the sound speed profile of the sun that you observe with helioseismology compared to the sound speed profile that you would have predicted with the models. And this is the location of the base of the convection zone. And you can see that by changing the composition, you change the sound speed profile of the interior. Now, when we're not talking about the solar case, and instead we're talking about the stellar case, we're looking at a much wider range of metallic metallicities. So although this is a small detailed effect in the sun, when you're talking about the difference between orders of magnitude in composition here for other stars, you're able to say that the convection zone should actually probably move quite a bit more than it would in the case of the sun. And so this is the hook into composition. The idea is you go look in astroseismic frequency spectra, measure the signature of this acoustic glitch, which gives you the base of the convection zone, and then use that base to tell you about composition. So the question is, how well does it work? Is it sensitive, and does it care about systematic uncertainties? And the answer is, it is actually a fairly sensitive probe of composition. What this plot is showing you here is 
various models at different compositions. So each of these curves represents a model at a given metallicity, where red here is plus 0.6 and the purple is minus 1.2. So along each of these given lines, you're looking at many different masses. Individual mass tracks are shown here. And you're seeing on the y-axis the normalized acoustic depth to the feature. So a large tau CZ here is a deep convective envelope, and a small tau CZ is a shallow convective envelope. And if you look at fixed mean density, you see that metallicity varies the location of the base of the convection zone quite substantially. And we want to work in mean density because mean density is something that we automatically get out of the astroseismic frequency spectrum. So you can ask then, how sensitive is it? And it is about a 1% change in the location of the base of the convection zone per 0.1 dex in metallicity. And you could say, fine. With a given set of stellar models and input physics, maybe this is true, but how well do you do when you start talking about systematics? So we went through the exercise of asking, if you change your opacity tables, how much does this change your answer? If you change your diffusion coefficients, if you change your assumptions about your equation of state, if you assume that your element mixture is different and you run these things again, how much does it change? And so that's all of these theory points in here, how much systematic change you get in the inferred metallicity given a location of the base of the convection zone for different um, input physics. We can make assumptions about how well we'll be able to measure the other observational quantities we care about, like mass, radius, age, helium abundance. All of these things are accessible through astroseismology. Uh, and the observational uncertainties on the astroseismology itself. And when it's said and done, you get a uncertainty on the metallicity that is 0.15 to 0.3 dex, which is not too shabby, even in comparison to spectroscopy. And now this is an independent means of getting at composition. This is not a, a spectrum where you're looking at metal lines from a species that isn't necessarily extremely abundant in the star. This is sensitive to things like oxygen. And it is an averaged opacity weighted indicator of the composition of the star. So this is a very nice, very independent way of getting at the compositions of the deep interiors of stars. Um, so you might ask, well, does it work? And the answer is probably. We have, about half the, we have about a dozen stars which you've actually been able to do this measurement. It turns out you need a very nice astroseismic frequency spectrum in order to pull out this kind of modulated um, signature. And for those 12 stars, um, it looks pretty good. You have a very strong dependence on the location of the base of the convection zone as a function of mass. That looks like it's working. And the metallicity dependence looks good. I'm not going to show you the plot because it's so preliminary. It's not even, it shouldn't even be put up yet. But so far, so good with this. So that's, that's how you measure abundances with astroseismology. Yeah, yeah, so, so that's something we swept under the rug. This is, this is all under the assumption that the simple mixing length theory of convection that we've used is the correct one. So, yes. Yeah. Right. Well, I, yes, if you, if you make the assumption that the spectroscopic abundances are doing a good job, then yeah, definitely. I guess it's sort of related, but how fuzzy is the convective radiative zone transition if you have like convective overshoot? Yeah, it's very sharp in the sun. It's 0.05 pressure scale heights. So in the sun, very sharp. Uh, this is when you, convective overshoot is much more important when you're talking about core convection. The envelope doesn't really get much overshoot at all. Uh, there's nitrogen in there. Iron is about a quarter of it. So those are you, you're not gonna you're never gonna get an individual abundant uh, individual abundance measurement. You're going to get an opacity averaged measurement of the most important species, which will be oxygen, nitrogen, iron, for the opacity at that location in the convection zone. Um, it's a complicated question because in order to get the luminosity measurements that get you this, this is 16 sig from the Kepler mission. Uh, you need to launch something into space. So, 
But you can get many stars at the same time. But you can get many stars at the same time. This particular spectrum is um, it's one minute cadence. Uh, it's probably, it's at least a month. It might be 42 days. It might be longer of constant staring at this star, which happens to be one of the brightest stars in the field, so it is the best. So it's expensive in that sense. You can do spectroscopy from the ground. Um, there is a network that's designed to do it called SONG. It's a bunch of one meter telescopes all over the planet. They have spectrographs on them that are R of 100,000. And over the course of their entire lifetime, they think they will do a dozen stars. So you get far fewer stars, but actually the spectroscopy gets you a much, much better frequency spectrum, much, much better spectrum, because there's less noise when you do it in spectroscopy as opposed to intensity. So it, de it depends on what your goals are. I think. The goal is to test your stellar model. I think it's, it's a noble goal. You, you do have two independent yeah. goals. Yeah. They, they both have a place because the spectroscopy really gets you beautiful cases, individual case studies to work on. And then the intensity measurements get you a much larger sample of stars to study. Shall I start? Can you hear me? Okay. <clears throat> so hello everybody. Um, I'm a PhD student in Volker Springer's group in Heidelberg, where I work with Volker on um, numerical methods in astrophysics. And today I would like to tell you something about hydrodynamic shocks in cosmological simulations. Um, so this is mainly numerical work, but I hope I can still provide you with some insights which you might find interesting. Um, so why are shocks interesting? Well, um, first of all, shocks are locations of particle acceleration and um, uh, cosmic rays are accelerated to very high energies uh, via the Fermi um, shock acceleration mechanism. But um, on the other hand, from a fundamental point of view, in my opinion, um, shocks, the possibility of forming shocks is the outstanding feature of hydrodynamics. They arise from the nonlinearity of the oil equations. And if you want to learn something about the gas dynamics uh, in the universe or in simulations, um, you can learn a lot by just looking um, at the shocks. So the picture I have in mind when I think about shocks um, is this one, this stick man. And actually, I've also prepared an NFL version because I've heard you like American football, <laughs> right? So you have basically, um, you think of these stick men as gas molecules, and they move from the left to the right supersonically. Then there's some obstacle. And um, what you get is a shock front moving from the right to the left. You have um, a jump in all the primitive variables on the post-shock side, which is uh, the right side, you have a higher pressure and density, and on the left side you have a lower pressure and density. And you can calculate the Mach number from these uh, jumps, from the Huguenot jump conditions, and the Mach number is just the velocity of this shock surface um, in units of the sound speed of the, of the pre-shock gas. And uh, the mass energy and momentum of, of these guys here adds to the mass momentum and energy of those guys, of course, um, but um, kinetic energy gets transformed into thermal energy. And in this respect, I, I talk about energy dissipation. And you can calculate how much energy gets dissipated just by um, subtracting the thermal energies in the post and pre-shock region. And you have to take into account um, that the gas is also adiabatically compressed in the post-shock region. Then you can uh, plug in the jump conditions and you can work out that the energy um, dissipation just depends on the pre-shock um, density and the pre-shock sound speed and the Mach number. Okay, so how does it look uh, in simulations? I don't have a lot of time to talk about my algorithm, um, but it's, it's not just a local criteria or something. It's a little bit more sophisticated. If you're, interesting, if you're interested, you, you can look into my paper. So this is a, <coughs> a, a plot of the baryonic overdensity of a non-radiative simulation, so a simulation without feedback. And uh, so all we have here is uh, our accretion shocks and, and the merger shocks. And if I run the, the shock finder, basically this is the Mach number field uh, I find. And uh, you can see 
Um, basically, the, the, the large picture, which you all know, of course, is that the gravitational energy um, gets converted into kinetic energy, and the gas flows shock heat onto, onto these cluster outskirts and onto structures. Um, you can have quite high Mach numbers, up to 100. Um, this is when the, the code flows from the voids um, shock heat onto the structures because they are the, um, the sound speed is very low because they are very cold. And uh, these, these shocks are also called external shocks, so they have a high Mach number. And then you have internal shocks inside structures where you have uh, lower Mach numbers because the temperature is higher and, and the sound speed is higher. Um, so then we can have a look at the energy dissipation. And um, there we can see that most of the energy, so red is uh, low energy dissipation, white is high energy dissipation. You can see that most of the energy is dissipated inside uh, the cluster. And this is just because there you have a higher density and a, and a higher temperature and therefore more energy dissipation. Then you can do um, shock statistics. Here I just plot the energy dissipation as a function of Mach number for different redshifts. So the red curve is redshift um, 6 and the blue curve is redshift 0. And you can kind of see this bimodal distribution that you have um, low Mach number shocks. These are the external shocks. But um, yeah, and, and they dissipate a lot of energy because they are internally. And then you have these external shocks with high Mach numbers and they uh, don't dissipate a lot of energy. So this is this bimodal distribution. And uh, this is now a simulation without feedback um, from stars and black holes and so on. But then I've, of course, also looked into the full um, physics illustrious simulation. So here I show the, the temperature, the bionic overdensity, um, the Mach number field, and the energy dissipation. And um, we zoom onto one, one cluster. We start at redshift uh, of around 4. You can see, first of all, the cosmic web. And then we have, um, yeah, stellar winds, which drive some shocks. And uh, we have also black holes in the center of this cluster, um, which um, produces set of like explosions. And uh, these explosions can have quite high Mach numbers, especially if, if the shock reaches um, outskirts of the cluster. And you can also see that the energy dissipation is quite high. So this is um, the, the radio mode feedback from the, from the black holes, which might be um, a little bit um, too high in the illustrious simulation. <coughs> Okay, and uh, then we can compare the statistics. So here I have the, the run without feedback, and here's the full physics illustrious run, um, just from, from the movie I've seen. And uh, the first thing you notice is that um, you have basically higher Mach numbers, uh, which are relevant. So here you have Mach numbers up to several hundreds, whereas here most of the energy is dissipated between Mach number uh, 1 and 3. And the second thing, you have also an overall higher energy dissipation. So here the, the axis um, goes up to 10 to the 43 Earth per second in megaparsec cubed, and here's uh, 10 to the uh, 41. So you have um, a huge difference when you analyze the shock statistics um, in full physics run compared to non-rated uh, runs. Yeah, so in the um, last couple of minutes, I just want to show you um, some findings, um, which might be interesting. So. I've looked uh, into many, many clusters uh, at redshift 4. Because at redshift 4, we don't have yet the strong um, feedback from the black holes. And I posed the question, um, what's, the, what's the thermal history of the gas inside this cluster? So does the classical picture hold that the gas gets shock heated to the real temperature at, at some point? Or are there maybe cold flows inside these filaments, which can directly feed the central region with cold gas? And um, well, we can just have a look at the, at the shocks. And uh, here you can see, first of all, the, the cosmic web. And then you have um, an outer accretion shock with quite strong Mach numbers, up to 10, 50. And um, what you can see is that weak filaments um, shock heat already on this outer accretion shock. But then we have also two um, big filaments. And there the gas can actually stream freely into the outskirts of this cluster. But then it gets shock heated at an inner accretion shock. Okay, And this is... This is not a special halo. I have looked into many halos, also with lower masses, um, around 10 to, the, 10 to 11 solar masses. So this is a typical picture we find that either um, the gas gets shocked already at the canonical accretion shock, or that we find an inner accretion shock um, in the case that we have filaments sticking into the inner um, region of, of these outer accretion shocks. Um, the second thing I wanted to share with you is um, yeah, something else which we find um, not too often, but it's also not really rare. Um, I have here a cluster from non-radiative run, but it's just about the dynamics in this case. And if I have a look at the, at the shocks, we can see here this um, spiral structure. And um, we have here the, the, um, the accretion shock. 
and then we have the spiral structure here. And this is um, basically a post-merger um, dynamical sloshing scenario. So we have a merger of two, of two halos, and then um, when it has ended, the gas still sloshes around in the main potential well. And you can actually um, compare, this, compare, compare this to something I found in literature. So this is a, a Virgo cluster in, um, surf, in X-ray residual surface brightness. And there you can also observe some, some slush, sloshing motions. But in the literature, um, these are claimed to be contact discontinuities. And here we can basically see that um, in the simulation, it can also steepen to shocks. And um, if, you, if we go back, um, we can also see that basically the shock fades into a contact. OK, so here, here's standard contact. So I have not done this exercise, but it will be interesting now to actually um, look how, how long do these spiral structures live and how much electrons can be accelerated and maybe how much um, diffuse radio emission can be produced by, by such um, spiral structures. So as, as I'm German, I'm in time, I guess, and I just uh, leave you with my take-home messages. So thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so we are working on a cosmic ray implementation in, in our repo, and uh, we, are, we are running already first tests that we couple the shock finder to the cosmic ray um, implementation and uh, in, yeah, in check cosmic rays at location of shocks. So this is definitely um, one thing we have planned to do. Uh, I, I don't know the, the numbers, but I can um, I agree that in most of the clusters we don't find supersonic turbulence because um, yeah. But um, nevertheless, I said it's, it's not rare, but it's also not too too common that we see these spiral structures. I have to investigate this further. I'm, I'm not sure about this. Yeah. So you you are referring to the spiral structures or the, cl the ambient cluster environment is generally subsonic. Yeah. It probably depends on the merger rate and, and how long these spiral structures live and the time scale of, of their vanishing and things like this. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so the the inner shock where the cold flow does does shock. Do you have a sense of whether the like relative to the virial radius is that is that basically fixed? Does it depend on the mass of the halo? Um, so, uh, yeah, when I, if I remember correctly, it was always close to the virial radius. And um, in non-radiative simulations, the, the outer Grecian shock is always around the 1.3 rule radii. And, um, yeah, that's right. So, the bottom line is you don't have cold flows reaching the center. Is that right? At least There's for at that, uh, for this mass range in, shock, yeah. in this simulation. In that simulation. So, but how should I think of that shock? Is it that... As the stream is coming, it's got a bow shock because it's highly supersonic. Yeah. And somehow all the bow shocks of the different streams yeah. combine and give you one shock. So this is basically this picture. Yeah, I've zoomed in and I plot. So the arrows is, uh, encode the velocity field. The color of the arrows is the, is the velocity. And you can see it streams inwards. And then it gets accelerated um, inside this filament up to these red arrows, which are around 500 kilometers per second. And if you then have a pre-shock um, temperature of, of around 10 to the 5 Kelvin or something, you get these Mach number 10 shocks, right? And um, one thing that surprised me is that you don't only get a shock in, in the direction um, of this filament, but also perp perpendicular to these, um, to these filaments. And I think this is because the, the cold gas from, from the filament mixes with the shock-heated gas from right and left and decreases the, the temperature, and then it can... The gas is colder and gets accelerated and can shock heat again. So you get a so inner. It's a more or less spherical shock. Yes, that's what I think. Really just one stream coming in. Yes, because I think the cold gas cools. Uh -huh. uh, it's the second phase which cools the, the shock heated gas, in my opinion. Yeah.
Sometimes the Sumi spirit goes Sumi. Thank you very much, Kevin. Yay. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Oops. Come on. Okay. Uh, my name is Rodolfo Montez. I'm from Vanderbilt University, which is in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm a postdoc there in the Fisk Vanderbilt Bridge Program mentoring students doing research and other things like that. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about a subject that a colleague of, uh, of mine in Sweden, Sofia Ramstedt, have been studying. We're essentially looking for high energy emission from AGB stars, which most people don't think actually emit this. So it's kind of a, that's why the title of my talk, Out on a Limb, because we're out there looking for something that nobody thinks is there. <clears throat> And nobody thinks it's there because if we look at giants evolving off the main sequence, when they get past a certain temperature in their evolution, the coronal X-ray emissions disappear. And this was seen originally first in ultraviolet emission, and then you saw it in ROSAT observations as well of a volume-limited nearby giant sample. And so this is called the coronal dividing line, or it also, also goes by the original um, authors who discovered this line in the using far UV observations. And it's about here. And this over here is called the coronal graveyard because there's no, or people think the corona is no longer present. And there's possible explanations for this that include maybe the dynamo is dying down because you have this expanding envelope of material and it's slowing down the dynamo and it's stopping the generation of these magnetic fields. Or it's because you're transitioning at this line from this fast, hot wind that's similar to what our sun has to this more dense and cold wind, and that dense and cold wind could just completely absorb all of the coronal X-ray emission. <clears throat> but when you, when you look at ultraviolet observations in the coronal graveyard, you do find signatures that the chromosphere is still being heated somehow, and so it gives light, it gives a, a hint that that there is still magnetic activity being generated, and so that corona could still be there. <clears throat> and so maybe you're hitting an observational limit. You can't see very well with ROSAT because it doesn't have the sensitivity to look through this higher column that's obscuring the coronal emission. So that spurred us, along with these observations, to look for evidence of this. These observations are of the circumstellar environment around an AGB star. And notice the scale here is in log of radius. This is the surface of the star, of a Myra, about 1 AU. And this is the atmosphere outside of that, which is where you have dust and molecules forming. And when you look at circular polarization signatures of those masers in this area, you actually can measure magnetic field strengths. And these boxes here show you the range of measurements that people have found for these, maser, for these field strengths determined from maser observations. Um, <clears throat> the masers happen at different parts of the atmosphere, and so you actually can trace the magnetic field through the circumstellar environment. But I'll warn you that these are not all for one object. These are for a group of objects. We don't have them all for one object. These lines, these two lines here, the broken line and the solid line, show you a couple of possible magnetic field relationships. Power laws showing you how the magnetic field might be at the surface if you believe that these magnetic fields are called, caused by a global magnetic field and not just little pockets of magnetic field that have been amplified at their location. <clears throat> so you can see that 
these measurements suggest that the surface magnetic field could be of order of Gauss or it could be order of 100 Gauss. And that magnetic field is important because every mass loss mechanism does not include the magnetic field. It only includes the radiation pressure on dust grains. And so actually saying, yes, there is a surface magnetic field there and you have to include it in your models can really open up and explore some new physics in the mass loss mechanism at this phase of the HR diagram. <clears throat> so spurred by those, we looked for X-ray observations with more modern telescopes like Chandra and XMM to see if we can actually get down to a further deeper limit. We built a catalog of about 500 AGB stars. This concludes carbon, my, carbon AGB stars, Myra AGB stars, and these S-types, which are rare, but that have essentially equal carbon and oxygen in their atmospheres, and circumstellar envelopes. Uh, we only found 13 observations in that entire 500 source list. Very few observations, serendipitous or otherwise, of AGB stars. And in that, we didn't find any new discoveries of X-ray emission from the Chandra and XMM, but we did find two previously unidentified or unassociated AGB stars in the ROSAT catalog that emitted X-rays. And I'm showing you them here. I'm showing you the two galax bands here for these stars, and I'm showing you the ROSAT observation here to show you that, yes, they are there, but maybe not <laughs> if you squint. So, and I'm also pointing out that here you see that Galax actually sees these two AGB stars as well. And so the, the, the UV emission is not completely attenuated unless it's coming from a companion or another source or coming from above this circumstellar envelope. We got a new observation with XMM of T. draconis based on this ROSAT detection, and it definitely is at the location of T. draconis, so I can tell you that it is definitely coming from the star or immediately in its vicinity. And this is the spectrum. The thing you'll note is that, is that it's pretty high energy, it, and the temperature that we fit, if we fit a thermal plasma to this, is about 50 megakelvin, which is outrageous to think about how that can be coming from this very tenuous AGB star. Uh, the column density that we find is actually consistent with what you would expect the column to be in the circumstellar environment, in that circumstellar shell of material. If you assume a constant mass loss and velocity, you can calculate that. And the lx del bowl is modest. It's not outrageous. It's believable that this could be coming from the AGB star. <clears throat> uh, Sahai and others have looked for more evidence for X-ray emission from a sample of AGB stars that were targeted because they have high far UV flux. And also because Hipparchos solutions to their parallax were funny, meaning that they're possibly binaries. And in these three detections that they made of the six samples of stars, you see very similar features, very high energy emission, suggesting that maybe we're not looking at this coronal emission because these temperatures are so high, we've never seen something like that that's not flaring, that's always present. It's hard to explain that as a coronal emission, so maybe we're looking at accretion onto some companion, some really compact companion, because you need a very low mass to, ra mass to radius ratio in order to explain this accretion temperature. <clears throat> But we actually have measured, finally, the very first detection of a surface magnetic field from an AGB star. The star's name is Chi Cygni. This is the evidence for it. I don't know much about spectral, spectral photometric observations, so I just know that the V Stokes signature is up there, and it's present. <clears throat> and it's, it's been shown that it is Zeeman in origin, so it is magnetic. It's an indicator of the magnetic field. You can actually measure this magnetic field, or at least a component of the magnetic field, and it's about two or three gauss. But this is a component of the magnetic field, so that's actually just an upper limit, or I'm sorry, a lower limit. And so it's about there, consistent with what we would expect. And actually, one of the, one of the uh, points in these boxes is coming from Chi Sig. And so we have really strong evidence now that it's cons it is consistent with the global magnetic field permeating through this circumstellar shell going all the way to the surface. So what I want to do is try to target chi -sig in the upcoming cycle for XMM to try to get an X-ray observation of this to see if it's consistent with what we think it should be at the surface. 
uh, with this observation. Well, this is a ROSAT observation that I pulled out of the archive, and there's not a detection there. I don't call it a detection, but maybe if you squint your eyes and if you bend it up a little bit, you might think it was a detection. But I don't think it's a detection. Uh, and I'll tell you why, because when you look at the part of this, the light curve that this ROSAT observation was taken, it was happening during a trough in the light curve, in the, in the visual light curve of this object. And the magnetic field measurements are coming from this peak here. And so we need to hit that peak in order to be consistent with what the, we expected magnetic field uh, strength to be. And so I want to look at it in the upcoming XMM uh, cycle and try to find an X-rays coming from it and t test that to see if whether or not this relationship between the magnetic flux and the, and the X-ray luminosity persists all the way into the AGB, which then allows us to use it as a proxy for the magnetic field, use the X-rays as a proxy for the magnetic field. And with that, I'll stop. Tell you that's the nut that I want. <laughs> uh, there's tons of radio emission, but there's so many molecules that you see actually the circumstellar shell mostly in the radio. You're not seeing deep down into the star. There, there are some really great uh, group over in Sweden, uh, Wouter Lemmings, and they're actually studying, they're trying to map through, with the masers the magnetic field lines coming out of these to show how that could potentially be shaping the outflows from these stars. But actually constraining the, the rotation of the star itself, I haven't seen anyone try to do that yet. I think we're just trying to get this, we're trying to establish that magnetic fields are there. Mm -hmm. But also of Mimas, which was a big no no. It was canonical wisdom, they start to not emit X rays. Right. But it was also a learning lesson. So it was the first one ever. Yes. But it was a learning lesson as well, because so when you see a UV emission and you can't resolve the system, and most of these binaries are not resolved, you assumed it was coming from the white hole, from the accretor. Right. And it was a learning lesson, because when I saw the I don't know what I'm about to say supports this directly, but it is a possible explanation for what I'll say. Years ago, we observed uh, the carbon root star uh, IRC plus 10216 or with, with the satellite, and we observed uh, water toward this star, which should not have been there. Uh, and I say that because in a carbon-rich environment where carbon is more abundant than oxygen, all of the oxygen gets locked up in CO, mm -hmm. and the water abundance is about 10 to the minus 11 or 12 relative to H2. We measured it at 10 to the minus 6 relative to H2. And uh, we've never had a great explanation for that, uh, other than the fact that somehow or other that CO has to be photo destroyed mm -hmm. very close to the star to free up oxygen to form this water. We know the water is coming from close to the star because we observe several transitions of water and we can calculate its, its excitation temperature. So I don't know if it's correlated, but the presence of UV or X-ray radiation close to the stellar surface might be the agent that's breaking apart the CO and allowing water to form. That We've since learned it's not unique to this one carbon star. We've observed several other carbon stars, and we see a 
novel with three power water. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the the direction I'm interested in going because I, typically when we think about the way these circumstellar shells are processed, we think about the UV radiation from outside affecting the chemistry of these shells around AGB stars. They can't, they can't get in. But now we're going from the inside and the outside, and we're, we're providing two sources of high energy photons that can mix up the chemistry. And it's really exciting to that direction. Thank you, Rodolfo. And everyone, please step out for the photo.